my job this evening is to talk tax-free investing. Back in 2015 was when tax-free investing started, introduced in the 2015 budget, which would have been February, kicked off in March of that year with an annual limit of 30,000. I'm gonna come back to the limits and the like, we will park that for a moment. Uh, that limit was increased the following year to 33,000. And so next Friday, 1st of March, we start the journey again with another year. And now we're looking still 33,000 per year per individual. Uh, Governor Tito Mbuweni didn't make any changes to tax-free investing. I'll talk about that. We've been able to put about 129,000 if you totally maxed out every year. And if you have, you probably have about 129,000 in your account. Um, there probably was a worse time to be an investor, uh, five-year period. I'm struggling to find it. Uh, we have gone sideways. And I mean, and I'll show you charts in a moment. Nothing has happened. Uh, importantly for us is that uh, transfers came in effective uh, last year. I'll talk more about transferring your tax-free account as well if you need to make a transfer. So let's quickly go through a recap. Then I'm going to run through some new ETFs that have arrived. I'm going to look at what's happening out there in the space. And I'll look at what I'm going to be doing with my ETF portfolio uh, starting Friday next week when the new tax year kicks into the equation. In short, tax-free accounts are exactly as they say. No tax at all. So we don't pay dividend withholding tax, currently sitting at 20% when you receive dividends. Within a tax-free account, you don't pay that. We don't pay any tax on interest. If you earn interest, it goes into your income, subject to some T's and C's. In a tax-free account, you don't pay any interest, any tax on interest. You've got no capital gains. So if you make a profit, and I know in the last five years you might not have, but trust me, one day you'll make a profit. Uh, when you then sell, you have no CGT liability either in that particular space. No income tax and no security transfer tax as well. The security transfer tax is a cheat. You don't pay that on ETFs anyway. But the point is, no money to government. <clears throat> and what happens every year, as happened yesterday, is the relevant finance minister, whoever he may have been over the last five years, stands up and essentially takes money out of your pocket by taxation. Uh, and this is the one space where they actually give money back to you. And they give money back to you by saying, if you invest within this vehicle, we won't tax any profits that you make. A couple of important points what this means. And the first point is, is that, yes, you can put your money into your tax-free account, and you can buy an ETF, and you can come back in 40 years and be richer. But you can equally transact as often as you want. Because there's no CGT, because there's no tax on interest, there's no tax dividend withholding, you can actually trade in these accounts as much as you want. And that's perfectly within the rules of the act. I, I, and and, and there, there's reasons why, they've, why they, they practically can't clamp down on that tradability within the account. So you can trade them. And there's one Oak in Durban I know who's done incredibly well with his trading, and he's turned his 100 odd, 129,000 into 180 odd thousand. Of course, the people who have traded their, their tax free accounts and lost half their money, they're not calling me up and telling me how bad they did. So I know one Oak's done well, and there's probably a lot of people who haven't done well. Top tip don't trade. That's just common sense because trading typically loses money uh, unless, yeah, just, just don't. You can, it's legal, but you probably shouldn't. There is one tax you pay. When you die, this money forms part of your estate. And if that estate is large enough, it is subject to estate duty. Truthfully, not my problem. I'm dead. I got bigger worries. But that is when you will pay some tax ultimately, is when you have, when it forms part of your estate. Until that point, there's no worries about tax whatsoever. There's an important point that everyone brings up. In truth, it's quite small. You own an offshore ETF and the S&P 500, for example, which means that they pay dividend tax in South Africa, sorry, in America, and you want to claim that dividend tax back. And the IRS basically says, no, they just not interested. If you're paying dividend tax in foreign jurisdictions, whatever that foreign jurisdiction is, you're not going to get that money back. End of story, nice, but not going to happen. And truthfully, it is a small amount. It would be nice if we got it back. It would upgrade the retirement by, I don't know, maybe you could have extra chips on the side or something just once. But that money in offshore, you don't get the tax back on that. It is small, but we get that question all the time of, oh, I paid tax on my offshore ETF. Can I get it back? No, you can't. Because truthfully, those other jurisdictions, be they whichever they might be, Europe, whatever they might be, 
they don't care about our tax-free accounts. They just have zero interest. You can't get the money back. It's for individual residents of South Africa only. You do not need to be a taxpayer. You do not need to have a tax number, but you need to be in South Africa. So you can't set it up for your parents who live somewhere beyond the borders of our country. I've been asked that question repeatedly. Nice idea. No can do. Uh, you can't set it up for, for companies, trusts, PTYs, CCs, any of those type of things. Has to be an individual. Has to be a South African resident. You can do it for children. You can do it for a child from any age whatsoever. The important distinction there, if you're doing it for a child, the parent or the guardian will do the FICA, of course, that standard per, uh, process in that regard. And when the money is withdrawn from the tax-free account, it has to go into a bank account in the name of the holder. That bank account has to be South African, and that name obviously needs to match. So at this point, if you're putting money away for a child and they haven't got a bank account, that's no problem because they're not drawing the money at this point. When they do draw the money, then it becomes an issue. At this point, absolutely not. If the child is under seven, you can't go to a stockbroker. You've got to go to an FSP. I'm not going to delve into the technicalities of that. But if you've tried to open for a child under seven and returned away, that's why try again at a different place. Speak to me afterwards. I'll tell you where you can find FSPs as distinct from stockbrokers. For most of the market, we don't see the difference. There is a technical difference in terms of stockbrokers and the rules applicable and laws and all of that sort of thing. Um, what is very important as well is that if you are funding a tax-free account for your children in their name, when they turn 18, it is now their tax-free account. And you can tell them how to be a responsible 18-year-old and how not to spend it on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I remember being 18. I don't remember my mother telling me that, probably because of too much sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, when they turn 18, this is now their tax-free account, and they can do with it as they wish. Short answer, you've got 18 years to turn them into responsible adults. Good luck with that. There are limits to the tax-free account. The one limit is you can only deposit 33,000 Rand per year per individual. Very important. If you have tax-free accounts with different stockbrokers, you can't do 33,000 per account. It is 33,000 per individual per year. The year is the tax year, so it runs 1 March to end of Feb. So Thursday next week is the end of the tax year. Boom. Friday next week, 1st of March, resets our 30,000 Rand resets. If you only put 25,000 in this year, you can't take that 8,000 that you missed and roll it into next year. Next year remains 33,000 Rand. At points, the relevant minister will potentially change those limits, but for now it remains 33,000 a year, 2,750 a month, however you want to spin it. You can put it all in on day one. You can put 10 Rand a day for 330 days. Whatever you want to do, it's, it's up to you. The point being is that that is the limit. If you exceed that limit, SARS will penalize you at 40% of the excess money deposited. And that doesn't get credited to any other tax. That's just SARS saying, ha ha, free money. What they're essentially trying to do is stop the rich folks just dropping everything they own into it and saying, ha, who cares? 40% of anything in excess is penalized by SARS. And that is hard-coded. It's not set by, the, by your tax bracket or anything. It is 40% as written in the Act of March 2015. If you put money in and it grows, and I say if because it hasn't, but trust me, it will one day. When that money, you put 33,000 in and it grows to 37,000, don't panic. You're now more than you, but that wasn't a deposit. The limits are only on the deposit. And if you grow your 33 to 37, and then you decide you don't like that ETF, so you sell it and you buy another ETF, that doesn't impact your limits either. Your limit is only on deposit. Very importantly, you can deposit cash or you can transfer from another tax-free account. At this point, you can't because Treasury says in the last 10 days, no transfers allowed. So you can start transferring again from the 1st of March. So two ways to get money into a tax-free account, a cash deposit or transfer from another tax-free account. If you have an ETF with a broker and you now want to put that ETF into your tax-free account, you have to sell it. 
wait for the money, move it, wait for the money, and buy it on the other side. I know. It's like we're back in the 80s again. Your lifetime limit is 500,000 czar over the course of your life. 33,000 a year, 500,000 over the course of your life. When you have put 500,000 into your tax-free account, you will not be able to add any further money, end of story. The exception being, at some point, a minister may increase that limit. At this point, that limit is 16 years. So if you've been aggressively adding the money and you put another 33 in on, on Friday next week, you're still about 10 years to go until you hit that half a million rand limit. Once you've hit that limit, that's it. You can't put any more cash into your tax-free account. Does this make lots of sense to everyone because these are the important points. In terms of how much you put in, the limits are just the upper limit. You can put less. You're looking at 33,000 and thinking, man, if I had 33,000 lying around, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd be out there living at large. Fair comment. If you haven't got it, that's fine. Put what you can afford. You don't have to put the limit. You can put less than the limit. You can deposit as and when you want. There are no restrictions on that except that upper size and limit. And then comes to the withdrawals. So you are able to withdraw the money whenever you want. You can instruct, you can go to your tax-free account, sell whatever you have in your tax-free account, turn it into cash, draw the money out, and go drawling and have a great night. Maybe even a whole weekend of greatness. But don't, is the short answer. Because what happens is, whilst you are allowed to withdraw money, and it is completely at your discretion when you want to, no problems, it's designed for long term, and the reason is, is that, uh, I'm going too fast. The reason is simply that it has impact on your lifetime limit. Example, your lifetime limit is 500,000. So you deposit 25,000 into your tax-free account. Your lifetime limit remaining is 475,000, right? 500 less 25, you've got 475,000 of your limit remaining. You then draw money out, but your lifetime limit remaining is still 475,000. When you take money out, that lifetime limit does not increase again. In other words, you get one wash of that limit. That's all you get. You don't get multiple washes of that limit. So whilst you certainly can withdraw the money, it is a simple process. Uh, JC works on T plus three. So if you did it in a day, you'd have the money in three or four days would be in your bank account. This really is for money that is a long-term investment. And some of the numbers, and I'm not going to delve into them because they're not my numbers and I don't remember them. Patrick was talking about some stealthy wealth was in terms of that utilization of time. This is meant to be an investment that is running in the decades and in an ideal world for many, many, many decades. In an ideal world, if you start this with your first paycheck in the 20s and you run this for 40 or 50 years, that tax savings that you will make will be humongously significant even taking into account the limits that are there. And if we take it back further, if you started on the child's first day, you put an annual limit on, on day one and come back in 70 years' time, you will have a ginormous pile of cash. For the simple reason, time. The biggest asset an investor has is time. The more of it that we have, the easier it is. And it's not about buying the best ETF or the best whatever. It's just about buying a decent ETF and coming back in decades rather than coming back in a week and saying, you yeah, know, this isn't working and I got a hot date this weekend. Give me the money, I'm out of here. If we're able to give it the time, it becomes hugely significant. So it's what I say to folks. If you've got money... For an emergency fund, do not stick it in a tax-free. Stick it in a cash account. If you've got money for a motor car in two or three years' time or a wedding or a honeymoon or a child is coming and they're expensive, that sort of money should not go into a tax-free account because you're going to want it within a relatively short period of time. And when I'm saying relatively short period of time, I'm meaning anything less than 20 years. Which to the old peeps in the room is, I don't have 20 years. And to the young peeps in the room is, 20 years is a lifetime. Yeah. To the young peeps in the room, actually, you've got to wait 30 or 40 or 50. What this does, 
What it can do if worked properly and utilized over the full period and the money's remained and you start as soon as possible. What this will create is proper wealth in older age. And I say older because I'm getting to that older point, so we don't say old age. But it's going to create real wealth. It is the real deal. It honestly works. It's not going to make you Warren Buffett or Patrice Masepe. Uh, you're not, not going to buy a soccer team. That's not going to happen any day too soon. Or a cricket team, or apparently the Proteas are for sale after the way they played. <laughs> you're not going to get any of that. But what you are going to do is create real wealth. And that wealth will not only set you up for retirement, but it will create generational wealth. Because you're not going to live forever. And one day you're going to die and it's going to form part of your estate. And then it goes to your kids. Now, they will probably squander it, but that's, you know, you're dead. That's not your problem anymore. But we can truly, by that use of time, just by using time, we can actually create generational wealth just with tax-free and, and, and ETFs. And even within those limits. As I said, buying and selling within the ETF is not considered uh, withdrawals. You can do that as much as you want. I typically, although yeah, trading ETFs is cheap and with the tax-free accounts very cheap, my advice typically is there's still fees involved. There's a spread to cross. There's brokerage fees. There's no, you know, it's not, it's not completely free and frictionless in that process. Uh, but there, there are going to be circumstances where things change, better, cheaper ETFs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what can we buy? Well, we can buy ETFs. Now, I've been talking about ETFs already this evening for 50, oh, for, for 20 odd minutes, and a bunch of you are like, so what's that ETF thing? It's not an EFT, which is an electronic fund transfer. This is an exchange traded fund. It's kind of like a unit trust, if you know what a unit trust is. So what they do is they get everybody's money in, and they buy some shares, and you collectively get that movement of the shares. Yeah, that was jargon too. So let's keep it really simple. Let's say that half of you Oaks are unit trust managers. Let's make it this half down here. And you get money and you're a unit trust manager and the rest of you manage ETFs. What do the ETF people do? Well, they just go buy the 40 largest shares in the JSC. They stick it in a basket. They sell you a basket. And their day's done by 10 past 9 so they can go to the beach. Uh, aside from the small complexity of Johannesburg and no beaches. But that's all they basically do. And when that basket goes up, our market was up today, you are richer as a result. In fact, year to date, our market is up about 7%. You are richer than you were on the 1st of January. Of course, when that basket goes down, as it did last year, when it went down 12%, well, you were poorer at New Year than you were in the previous New Year. Because you just own those 40 shares. And they rise and they fall and they rise and they fall. And if you're in South Africa, they just go sideways for five years. And within that basket, once upon a time, was a company called African Bank. And it went bust. And another one was Steinhoff. And it's currently in the process of going bust. Companies are very slow about their death throes. But Steinhoff will get there. Give it time. And you owned those two companies if you had a, a top 40 ETF. But truthfully, you didn't notice. The day that Steinhoff, the disaster happened, what was it? 6 December 2017. Steinhoff in of itself lost 70% on that day. My top 40 ETF went down 0 0.5. 0 0.5. Other words, nothing. What do we know about a basket of shares? Over the long term, and remember when I say long term, I'm measuring decades, I'm not talking until T. Over the long term, stock markets rise faster than any other asset class. There are reasons behind it. There are structural reasons behind it. For example, when African Bank was on its way to bankruptcy, halfway down, they kicked it out. It's like, hey, you're going bust. You leave. You go away. Mr. Price, you come be the new one. It's a little more full, you know, a little more processed than that. But they boot out the losers. They bring in the winners. You throw in some inflation. Boom. Stock markets are the best place to invest. So that's you folks who are the ETF guys. And all your job is, is to decide of new ETFs and how much to charge. And then pretty much your day's over by about half past nine in the morning. They will all deny it. But you go to an ETF office at 10 o'clock and see who's at work. You folks are the unit trust managers. You are the active managers. You are the top of your class. You drive luxury German sedans and take holidays in exotic places with French names. Um, and drink bubbles. French bubbles, not Somerset West bubbles. And what you say is, no, 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 we're the smart kids in the class. We can pick the stocks that are going to go better than the average, and we're going to make everybody money. 
And truthfully, they're lying. And we know that they're lying because the evidence tells us this. And the evidence is the S&P, uh, they do a SPIVI, S&P indexation versus active. In other words, they take the ETFs and they say, well, what was your return? And they get a return. And then they go to the active managers and they say, so all of you smart kids, what was your return? And it turns out that only 15% of these oaks beat those oaks. 15%. One in six. Now, I don't know about you, but one in six is bad odds. You're picking an active one. How do you pick the winner? The short answer is we know of no way on how to pick next year's winner. There is no way on earth that we reliably have of picking next year's winner. So that's what the ETF does. It's a basket of shares. It's low cost because they only work half days. These folks want golf tournaments and German sedans and Verve Clicquot. These folks drink, I don't know, they would say, oh, okay, J.C. LaRue. No, 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 no. <laughs> I take that back. No good person drinks J.C. LaRue. Yeah, Graham Beck maybe. Yeah, Graham Beck makes some good bubbles and the like. So we've got lower fees. Typically, the unit trust industry, one and a half, two, who knows, maybe some performance fees. The ETF industry, we've got a really expensive ETF at, at under 1%. And we look at that and our eyes water. We can't believe 1%. Yo, who are these people? We won't name names. They're litigious. They're also not here this evening. I still won't name names. So they're low cost. They're baskets of shares. And then they're different methodologies. I mentioned the idea of the 40 biggest companies. We call that a top 40 ETF. We can also get, for example, an S&P 500. Same idea, except we've now gone to America and bought their 500 biggest companies. So how does that work? Well, they took your Randellas, turned it into US dollars, and bought all the shares. So now you've got two drivers of price. One, the American market. As it rises, you make money. And two, the currency. As it rises and falls, you will make or lose. As it weakens, you will make money. As it strengthens, you will lose money. Over the long term, our currency loses about 2% a year against the US dollar. But that is over the long term. From 1984 to date, the average depreciation per year is 2%. And that is essentially the difference in our inflation rate. Of course, in the short term, Yo, budget yesterday, Mr. Mbueni stands up, and as soon as he stands up, they release the budget, so now you can read it. So, of course, what do you do? Control F4, ESCOM, boom, first place. Everyone went to ESCOM. The RAND went from 1404 to 1440. By the time he'd finished speaking, it was back at 1404. All the traders are like, oh, we got that wrong, didn't we? This afternoon when I left the office, 1390. Yeah, it's going to go everywhere. My best advice with your ETFs is stop watching them. I know you can look at them seven times a day. And when you're making money, you feel like you're a rock star. When you're losing money, you'd wish you'd never heard of the JSC or Simon Brown or whoever the case may be. Top tip, just stop watching. I always wanted to, when I worked for a stockbroker, I wanted a facility where a client could say, I'm disciplined. Don't let me log in for the next six months. Compliance told me I'd have to go to jail first. So. So I'm going to come back to some of the methodologies, but in essence, an ETF is a basket of shares, and it's really, really cheap. And the basket and the cheap are the two parts that matter. Costs are one of the single biggest impacts. In fact, I said earlier, we have no way of knowing what will be the best performing unit trust. There is one measure we can use. It's not massively reliable, but it's the best one we have. If you're looking at a range of unit trusts, buy the one with the lowest fees. And it has the best chance of outperforming. Not guaranteed, but of course it has. If, if your unit trust is running at 6% a year and yours is running at 1%, well, you've got to do 5% better just to break even because you're taking six out of the pot. What can't you buy? You can't buy ETNs. I'm not going to delve into what they are, but if you've wondered why you couldn't buy that lovely China ETN from Deutsche Bank, this is why it's against the law. You can't buy commodity and currency ETFs. And the reason is quite simple. This treasury doesn't want you to put all your money into gold and then gold goes to $5 a ton. And you've got no more tax-free left. Ditto with why you can't buy individual shares. Because what happens if you put all of your money into, oh, I don't know, you put it into African Bank and that collapsed. So you put more money into Steinhoff and that collapsed and you've got no money left. So no individual shares, no REITs, real estate investment trusts, no derivatives, no products that have uh, 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 performance fees, just vanilla stuff, just vanilla exchange traded funds. There's some other bits. I'll touch on them in a moment. 
Your providers, I mean, pretty much every financial institution now provides you with a tax-free product. Uh, many of them are, are, are um, less great. Is a polite way of saying it, I suppose. Uh, check with your stockbroker. Check with your bank. Speak to the peeps who are here. The the we've got stockbrokers here this evening. We've got issuers. They have platforms as well. Uh, what are you looking for? Firstly, it must be a tax-free account. You can't say that is a tax-free account. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to actively open an account that is an appointed tax-free account by the provider. I personally want pure DIY because I can do my own buys and sells. You can get actively managed. In other words, they will do all of that for you. Uh, you also want cheap and you want no admin fees. This is not rocket science. There's not much we're paying for. This is run out of an Excel spreadsheet. There's no need for giant fees and luxury German sedans and fancy bubbles and all of that sort of thing. So I want cheap and I don't want to pay an admin fee. I, 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 that admin fee is money I can spend somewhere else. And you know what you say to yourself? You know, what's 1% a year? Yeah, nothing. 1% a year, because you've only got 33,000 there, right? So 1% a year is 330 rand. Pause a moment. Bottle of Graham Beck costs 160. So you just gave your provider two bottles of Graham Beck. Did they invite you to drink it with them? No. Hmm, I'm just asking. So, but that's in year one. Let's roll this forward to 50 years' time. And now I can make up anything I want because I won't be here in 50 years' time. But in 50 years' time, let's say it's 100 million. I don't know. Now they're taking a million bucks a year. Man, they can buy the entire estate of Graham Beck. The fees are small. But you understand the concept of compound interest, right? Interest on interest on interest. Fees are the exact inverse. They're being compounded out of your life. They're being compounded out of your pocket into somebody else's pocket. Now, there are no free lunches. I hear that. But particularly in this space, we want cheap. We want absolutely cheap. We are seeing discount brokerage rates, uh, typically, I mean, typically under a quarter of a percent. We're seeing discount straight. Uh, we're seeing low to zero admin fees, loads of those. Uh, some are plus 1%. If you're paying more than 1% a year, you are paying far too much. Speak to anybody out there at the back. None of them are going to rip you at 1% a year. Transfers, you can transfer. Why would you want to transfer from one provider to the other? Costs, product, you have the wrong product. You don't like the product range. If you want to transfer a tax-free account, speak to both providers, fill in all the forms, sit back and wait. Typically happening within about a week. Don't draw the money because that is a withdrawal, not a transfer. As I said, Treasury locks transfers for the last 10 days of the tax year. That's for reasons that are not important. But as of next Friday, we can off to the races and we can transfer again for the next 356 days. Because next year is a leap year. No one is as excited by that as me. Okay. Uh, unit trust or ETF, I've been down this road to a degree. Uh, both are allowed. You certainly can put unit trusts within your tax-free account, uh, not with any of the providers back there because they're honest providers. Uh, unit trusts are typically more expensive. You need a specific platform because they do not trade on the JSC, whereas ETFs trade on the JSC. Now, that's semantics, and some of you, uh, that excites, and you know what that means, but truthfully, they need somewhere where the buyers and sellers come to meet. What it also means is typically by trading on the JSC is that the fees are a little bit lower in terms of the expense ratios. And I'm not going to delve too high into that, but you can, if you want, put a certain unit trusts, not all of them. So what happened to our returns? Well, sorry picture. So this is our top 40 index. Actually, I took this on Monday and then I've been sick, so I've been sleeping. And it's actually gone up while I was sleeping. Um, but basically, that there is where we started five years ago. And, uh, well, I mean, we are above it by the smallest amount ever. Uh, it hasn't been a fun five years. A quick point on that. Markets correct two ways. Either we have a market crash where everything goes down. When a market crash happens, the best thing to do is stop looking. You know, the market has crashed hundreds of times. What has happened after every market crash except one? It goes up again. The exception is Japan, and we're not going down that road. But there's always an exception, right? There's always that uncle or something. But markets crash. So either they go crashing down and recover, or worse, 
they go sideways for a long time. What's happened during that long period of sidewaysness is the companies are making more money, more profit. Not a lot more, but they're making more profit. So they become cheaper. So that's a correction in time. It is a terribly unfun experience. Nothing we can do about it. I can promise you that one day it will go roaring to the heavens. I have no idea which day. Uh, so there's the rand over that period, and this is out of date because that's at 1410. The rand has now come back to about 1390. So we have seen a bit of weakness in the rand. The S&P 500 has actually done fairly nicely, and if you add the rand onto it, it's done lacquer. But the best money over the last five years has been money in the bank. This is the ABSA Tracy. We call it Tracy. It's basically a cash ETF. And that is your single best place to have got a return over the last five years. If you had put in 19 bucks, it's now worth 24.80. And that just breaks my heart because like, like don't, don't invest in cash unless you're old. And when I'm talking old, I'm talking very old, like, like three numbers. That's old. <laughs> I turned 50 this year. So if you ain't 100, you ain't old yet. That's my view. And I'm sticking to my guns on that. So the fact that cash was the winner in hindsight, sure. But importantly, in hindsight, what will be the winner over the next five years? Well, I will bet Christia's car that it won't be cash. Well, my car's fancier than yours. Mine doesn't have a roof. Yours does. So yours is better value. But could I be wrong? Well, and look, if this happens for the next five years, I'm moving to Tibet. And the reason I'm going to Tibet is because no one will find me there. They were actually Bloemfontein. Hey? I've often thought, you run away to Bloemfontein, no one's going to look for an escaped person in Bloemfontein. It's perfect. So what about some notable new ETFs? We've had a bunch of ETFs over the last little bit. We've had three in the tech space. The Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is actually mostly about airplanes and guns. We've had the Stanlib uh, 5IT, which is the S&P IT index. And then we've got the Satrix NASDAQ. Uh, and I'm not the expert here, but Wes is. I mean, he was on my TV show last year. He said, that's the one to buy. If you want tech, buy NASDAQ. Because if you buy the fourth industrial revolution, you're getting guns and other weird stuff. And I mean, maybe you like guns and weird stuff, but buy the Satrix if you want to buy tech. <clears throat> We're getting this new trend coming through, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment. The new trend is what we call factor-based. The factors are basically valuation, uh, low volatility, momentum, size, and quality. And we saw three from ABSA last year, which came out uh, around about this time last year. And we've also seen a momentum one come out from Satrix over the course of the year. That is uh, a, val uh, a value, uh, low volatility, momentum, and momentum. I'll come back to those in a sec as well. We get multi-factor based, which basically says, well, that's cool, but why don't we put all the factors in one basket? Five factors, one basket. I'm going to come back to that because core shares is changing the equal weight 40. So those are some of the new ones. We've got global bonds. Bonds. I'm not talking about your home loan. I'm talking about government debt. It's about the most boring space in the world to invest. Apologies to bond traders, if there are any. We have two. We have one, which is the G7. And then we also have one, which is the World Global Bond Index. And ironically, they both returned exactly the same amount which is just bizarre, but nonetheless, bonds are for when, bonds are for when, I don't know when bonds are for. I honestly don't buy bonds. Um, we also have emerging markets. Satrix has an emerging market ETF. Uh, remember, of course, that we are an emerging market. So what I'm saying here is careful of going all into emerging market and then also buying uh, ShopRite because now you've just got emerging and emerging and like emerging until it comes out of your ears. The benefit of the Satrix emerging market is broader. It's not just South Africa. You get some Vietnam. You, you probably don't get Venezuela, but you probably get some Turkey. And I don't know about Russia, but there you get all those sort of emerging market places. We've also seen a couple of property. Uh, Cloud Atlas have got the Africa XSA property. In other words, the rest of the continent, not us. That goes with the Africa XSA. In other words, you're buying the continent, you're buying Africa, but you're not buying South Africa. And the logic behind that is quite simple, right? We've got the South Africa stuff already. And if we include it, South Africa dominates, so excluded from the process. Uh, we've got a global property as well. And then Satrix launched a new property on the S&P. That's a Standard & Poor's index, also local. 
managed volatility ETFs. These only arrive on Monday. They are coming from ABSA. We have three of them. The idea about this is as markets are crashing, you move into cash. And as they're rallying, you go out of cash and back into equity. And I've explained it quick and short, and it's not that quick and short. Leonard is here. Chat to Len. Basically, you've got a, a, a higher, a moderate, and a low. This is for folks. I said don't buy bonds. If you are scared of the market, don't buy bonds. Buy that. What it's basically doing, if markets get highly volatile and look ugly, they're going to all explode cash, which is a great decision. Just they do it mathematically so we don't have the trauma of making that decision ourselves and ultimately being proved wrong. As I said, those only list on Monday. They, they just had their IPO. That process is still happening. Um, we've got a quality which comes from core shares, global dividends. And what this is, is not so much a dividend payer. What it does is it uses dividends to say, how do we define a quality company? So in America, the answer is, if you've paid a dividend for 25 years, you are quality. Which means no Apple. Uh, no Google, because they're not even 25 years old, which means no, uh, uh, who are those people who spy on us? Facebook, Facebook. Um, so they don't spy on us, they just steal our data. Spying is so last year. So what this is, is the boring companies like Colgate, who's not Colgate, I don't know who Colgate belongs to, Pomolive, someone. They're what we call those like consumer staples. Like, you know what, even probably when the, when, when the markets are crashing, we're still brushing our teeth. Yes? Just checking, yeah? just like, like <laughs> put it this way, I'm brushing my teeth regardless what happens in the market. So what that does is it uses that as its measure of quality. So you're getting kind of, with respect, the boring stuff. But boring is fine because they've been there a long time. They know how to do it. And if you say, but I want some of those people who steal my data, otherwise known as Facebook, well, then go get some Citrix NASDAQ at the same time and, and pair it with that. Then you've got data thieves and toothpaste. That didn't come out right, did it? Uh, so those are the ones that have come over the, the course of the year. There are going to be, we've seen we're up to about 65. The three new ones from ABSA will make it 68 ETFs that you can put into, into a, a tax-free account. Uh, and that list is going to be growing. And I think the growth is going to be a lot more in the what we call the smart ETFs. And what do I mean by smart? So a dumb ETF, no disrespect to those ETFs. ETF. Satrix 40 buys the 40 largest companies, puts it in a basket, and sells it to you. Nice and simple. The smart ETFs do some stuff in the background to make it a little bit cleverer, and in theory, to give you maybe less volatility, maybe better return, something like that. They're trying to bring a little bit of smart into it. We've got to be careful we don't push that smart too far and, and try and become Einstein's, and then it, it's kind of like the wheels fall off. Not that there's anything wrong with Einstein, but we've got to be careful. Maybe uh, Curie's a better example. Yeah, Curie's books are still too toxic to touch. They are so nuclear green that you actually can't go anywhere near them. And, I mean, this is just where she made her notes back in the day. Sidetrack, not important. So how do you choose? Well, yeah. Particularly, we have 65, let's call it 68 ETFs. The choosing part is hard. And part of that hardness is, well, should I buy South Africa, but I'm worried about ESCOM? Uh, should I buy S&P 500, except have you seen that man in the White House? I mean, yo, 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 yo. Um, so how do we choose what to buy or not to buy, as the case may be? Worse, what happens when you want to buy an ETF and they're three or four and they're all the same? Well, quite simple, we look at something called the TUR, Total Expense Ratio, Total Investment Cost. That tells you what it costs to run. Because an S&P 500 from Core Shares is exactly the same as an S&P 500 from Signia. The same 500 shares. The only difference is how much are you paying for the privilege. And then it's quite simple, pay less. So if you've got two of that are the same, pay less. Just that simple. A uh, quick point on feeder ETFs. This is starting to get a bit inside baseball. So some ETFs, instead of physically buying the shares, they just buy another ETF, particularly in the offshore space. So instead of doing the S&P 500 and going and buying 500 shares and putting them into a basket, or you go and buy an S&P 500 ETF in New York, and you stick that ETF into your basket. It is legal. You have the same levels of protection. 
There is risk that that fund that you are buying goes bust, but typically they're doing iShares, which is one of the biggest investment companies in the world, or Vanguard, which is again one of the biggest investment companies in the world. So your risk really remains market risk. So the feeder funds are fine. Often they can be a little lower fee, quite simply because the manager, the issuer of the ETF doesn't have to go and buy 500 stocks. They just buy one ETF. Deeply cunning. Now they can go home at five past, well, they can't go home at five past nine because of time zone. So they start work at four and they go home at 10 past four. So what of 2019? New tax year starts on 1 March, which is next Friday. And yesterday, Governor Mbaweni gave us his budget. That is not disrespectful. That is a picture from his Twitter feed. His favorite activity before being finance minister was to go and eat the hottest food he can find and then post a picture of it on Twitter. Um, but that is kind of pretty much how he felt. So the short answer is, is that he changed nothing. Literally, he changed nothing. The long answer is he actually delivered a very good budget in a very tough environment, considering this is an election year. And a lot of the nothing that he did means that he taxes us by stealth. So the fact that CGT didn't change the 40,000 exclusion means because of just good old-fashioned inflation, that we pay a little more tax. The fact that they didn't change the tax brackets means that if you get a salary increase of, say, 6%, you might only take home 5% because, well, bracket creep and Mr. Mbaweni has expenses. Lots of them. Notably ESCOM. And truth of the matter is, I'm quite a fan of him keeping ESCOM going because, well, you know, ESCOM. No, think about it for a moment without ESCOM. Because not only does the power go, eventually one day when the power is gone, the water goes. Because how do you think they clean the water? Yeah, ESCOM. So no changes to the budget, but changes. So let's talk about some practicalities. Cash. We keep on coming across the Royal We, Christia and myself, keep on coming across people who have put their tax-free account into cash. There is one thing more boring than cash. I mean, there must be, right? I can't think of what it could be, but there must be something more boring than cash. If you need income, or if you're really, really, really old, like, like three digits old, then maybe some cash. And there is a, a, a reason for it. Government is not increasing the interest exemption. So if you currently are under 65, the first 23,800 of interest that you earn is tax-free. The rest is added to your income and taxed accordingly. If you are over 65, the first 34,500 is tax-free and the rest is added to your income. And that is not going up. The government's view is you now have tax-free accounts. The problem with that is 33,000 a year, so it's going to take you time to get the money in there. And your second problem is a half a million rand cap, which means ultimately you're going to run into that cap. So there are places perhaps where cash works. The point with cash is that, so there was a tweet a while ago, uh, someone on, on Twitter was like, oh, they use an, a cash account and they get 8.1% and that's brilliant. In this environment, 8.1% on cash is frankly bleh. You can go to uh, retail bonds, South African government retail bonds, 10-year bond gives you inflation plus 4%. So your capital increases at the inflation rate, and you're paid 4% an annum. You can take the five-year retail bond paying 8.75% paid out biannually. You can go and buy the prefix uh, uh, ETF from Core Shares, which is a collection of preference shares, which are basically companies on the JSC issuing debt and you're currently yielding over 9%. In other words, if you need the income, or you need that safety, there are some other ways of doing it, and you're getting a better yield from it. And those can all be done in a tax-free account. Quick two points on the, on the retail bonds. They have zero costs, and your risk is government. Now, let's be honest. Government is not going to default to its citizens. Because it owns the printing press, man. It just goes and prints money. I know inflation and all of that. But you can pretty much call that a risk-free investment at a fairly nice yield. Your prefix is you've got preference shares, and some of those companies may default. Truthfully, those are like large banks and the like, and if they start defaulting, we've got bigger problems because we are queuing to get into Zimbabwe. But uh, aside from that, but in both cases, apart from that inflation linked, you're not getting capital appreciation. You're just getting yield. You might get a bit of capital in the prefix, 
but basically you're getting yield and that's what you're looking for. So cash is boring unless you want that income in the process. But then the question is, which ETF to buy? Now, part of the process, so ETFs are what we call passive investment. In other words, they just somewhere manage themselves. And when African banks starts to go belly up, they kick it out, they bring a new one in, everything's lacquer. They're passive, as distinct from the active, which is your unit trust space. So your passive is that you just buy an ETF and you leave it be. But that process of deciding which ETF is in of itself an active process. Well, do I buy SA40, uh, top 40, or do I buy S&P 40? What about Europe? And what about Japan? Maybe one day it will get back to new highs. It hasn't in 30 odd years, but you know, we're young and we're patient. That process of deciding what, which, etc., is an active process. And it's an active process which all the respect in the world, and I go into this rabbit hole on a repeated basis, your ability to see the future is exactly zero. And not yours, I mean collectively, our ability. Humanity's ability to look into the future is zero. What is going to be the best performer over the next five years? If you took me back five years ago and you told me it would be cash, I would have bet you Christia's car it wasn't. Yet here we are, five years later, it was cash. Who knew? So that act of picking becomes massively active. So then the question is, well, shouldn't we just somehow get one ETF to rule them all? One global ETF that over the long term will make us money. The answer is yes. We should. And they have a couple of options. We have the Ashburton 1200, which has some emerging market, but no South Africa. Well, in fact, no Africa. We have the uh, Satrix MSCI, that is developed economies. There is a Signia one as well, but the Signia one is a little bit very expensive, so don't buy that one. Um, we have the, the Glow Divs from CoreShares, which I spoke about a moment ago, where dividend defines the quality. And then truthfully, we have the Signia 500, which tracks the S&P 500, remembering that those companies, let's take Apple, for example. I mean, if you've got an iPhone in this room, well, you just paid profit to Apple, which is profit on the S&P 500, yet you're an emerging market. So yes, they're American companies, but only about half of their profits come from within America. The other half of their profits come from the rest of the world. So why do we pick a global fund rather than a local? The logic is fairly simple, truthfully, because global is you know, global economy works. And what's going to happen again if we pick individual sectors or individual markets? We're in a in a tight space. So the one I've been buying has been the Ashburton 1200. I've been buying truckloads of those. If you saw all the horror stories about the expense ratio, the, ter the high expense ratio, that was the unit trust, not the ETF, because unit trusts are sometimes expensive to manage. Um, but truthfully, any one of those does incredibly well in terms of a core ETF. And then if you want to get fancy, you can use that as your core and then add a few supplements around. For example, you look at that and you think, yeah, there's not much Africa here, so why don't I buy the Cloud Atlas Africa Fund? Or, that's nice, but I'm a little bit worried about rocky markets, so why don't I buy that low volatility uh, 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 ABSA one that's coming out on Monday? Or, what, this is lacquer and all, but I really think that one day Japan will have its day in the sun, so let's buy some Jap Japan as well. Understand that all of that is active, and the single biggest risk to your portfolio is you. Biggest risk to my portfolio is me. I buy the wrong stuff. But there certainly is no limit to how many that you can add into that space. But a nice single global, simple, come back in 40 years, you'll be rich. Not Patrice Masepi rich. Not even politician rich, probably. Well, because they're crooks. I'm not even talking our politicians. I just mean politicians, the whole bunch of them. However, that all said, I am of the belief that I have superhuman powers and I can see into the future. So I structure my portfolio with a core of ETFs and then some shares around it. And in that core of ETFs, what I've now done is I have a core ETF, which is my global, and then I put some individual ETFs around it. And the one I'm going to be buying on the 1st of March, which is Friday next week, is I'm buying some local property. 
The reasons are quite simple. There are three local properties, the one I already own, and then there are two others uh, from Stanlib and Satrix. Uh, dividends are taxed as income. So that tax can be quite onerous, but of course in a tax-free account, no tax, so no worry. Secondly, property in of itself is the cheapest it has been in 14, 15 years. And there's two ways you measure expensiveness on property, price relative to net asset value and yield relative to the 10-year government bond. And in this case, the price is around or below net asset value and yield is around or above 10-year bond. Both of those are when you buy property stocks. The property is looking cheap. Is there a chance I'm wrong? You bet you there's a chance I'm wrong. So caveats, disclaimers, et cetera, et cetera. If I'm right, Graham Beck, send it. If I'm wrong, sorry. That works in this industry. That's what I'm going to be doing. Understand a few things. Firstly, I already have my nice core of bland vanillas. And secondly, I fully appreciate that the risk is me. The risk is not EWC. Because a bunch of you are thinking, oh, what about expropriation without compensation? Expropriation without compensation is of zero concern. And there are two ways we know this is a definitive fact. There are three. The first is that Article 25 of our Constitution already allows for expropriation without compensation, but not enough to keep the politicians happy. The second reason we know is that NASRIC last year and the policy conference, and I can't remember where that was held, in 2015, both had the same provision out of the ANC, which said that we want to do expropriation without compensation with two provisos, no negative impact on the economy and no negative impact on food security. And the ANC has come out with that both times that they've said they want to do EWC. The third reason we know is that there is a panel of 10 eminent people, of which, I mean, I know some of them, the, uh, Professor Ruth Hall, who works at Class, there's that agri man on Twitter, and his name is gone, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed. There are smart peeps out there who are in this panel, and they have come up with five recommendations to government. The five recommendations are uh, state land that's not being utilized, state-owned enterprise land that has not been utilized, uh, what's the, uh, tribal land, in other words, the Ngorma Trust, King Goodwill Zolatini. If you were living in KZN in the early 90s, you know all about that debacle. Uh, so those are the first three. The fourth one is where the state subsidy on the land is more than the value of the land, and that is, i.e., people who've already been given money as land reform over the last 25 years. It excludes RDP houses because RDP houses do not get title deed anyway. And then the fifth is that if the land is owned solely for purpose of speculation. Now, how you define that, I'm not sure, but I'm quite excited because there's a piece of land on the West Coast that I want, and that oak owns it for one reason. Because I know what he paid for it, and I know he's selling it at five times the price, and I'm going to be first in queue and say, dude, expropriation without compensation. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, I'll give him a bottle of Graham back, and then we're in biz. The short answer is, they're not taking your house, they're not taking your shopping center. The longer answer is that this will not pass Parliament, because they need 66%, and the EFF won't support the ANC, because it's not radical enough, and the DA won't support the, the ANC, because, well, the DA. So it's just not going to happen. So yeah, this whole expropriation without compensation, no. Ignore it. It's politicking. It's going to get loud. It's going to get noisy. Ignore it. Quick last point. Core shares equal weight 40. This is an ETF that I've stood up here four years in a row and said, hey, it has a nice ETF to buy. Uh, turns out it wasn't. That's a different story. No, so the point with these, I spoke about factors, right? And there are those different factors that, that boogie along. And they're great and all. But what they typically do is nothing, and then suddenly they roar ahead, and over time they give you the performance. This ETF over 1, 3, 5, and 10 years has been beaten by the top 40, which means almost as certain as peanuts, next year it's going to like triple the top 40. The average will come back, but it'll be dead already. And that's the trick with factor investing. The problem is, is as individuals, we bought this because Simon stood on stage, and you watched it and watched it and watched it, and eventually you thought to yourself that Simon Oak is a mug, and you sold it. Of course, we can tell you sold it because it went from 400 million market cap to 120. And that's because you Oaks all sold it. Me? Hey, I still got mine. <laughs> However, what Core is doing is they are changing it. And there's the name. I'm not even going to. Scientific Beta CSSA Multi Beta Multi Strategy Six Factor Equal Weight Index. 
And actually, there's more to it because it's actually French, and it would be really cool if I could say it in French, but I can't. Basically, what they're doing is they're turning it into a multi-factor. So all of those different factors I spoke about, they put all of them into one basket. The code will be smart. The tour will go up a little bit. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, except to say I did a recording of a podcast with Chris Rule yesterday. Go to justonelap.com slash JSE Direct. You can listen to it more there. If you hold that ETF, you get to vote about whether they can or can't change it. You've got until the end of March. Contact your provider. Tell them how you want to vote. If everyone votes no, then it stays. If everyone votes yes in May, it will switch into becoming a multi-factor, better, beta, blah, 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 that thing there, and it will have the code SMART. I'm not sure about the code, nonetheless. However, so I own this ETF. I would like to continue holding the equal weight, but I suspect that it's going regardless. I will vote in favor, and I will hold the ETF. And that slide tells you why. If you hold the top 40, because of some very big companies, the effective price movement has been controlled by 12 stocks. Naspass, Richmond, Standard Bank, Billiton, Anglo. In other words, you've got some woolies in there, but it's not doing very much. If you hold the equal weight, well, then all 40 companies drive that return. And I want that. Why? Because the likelihood of Woolies doubling in price, no, terrible example, let's not use Woolies. Folks, Woolies needs help, hey, you must go buy chuckles on your way home, all of you, two packets. Uh, Mr. Price, Mr. Price needs some help. Can Mr. Price share price double? Well, a lot easier than Naspass because it's a smaller business. Naspass is a multi-trillion Chinese company. Can it double? Yes. But man, it takes a lot to go from multi-trillion to two times multi-trillion. So in those examples, you're lacking those small guys. And the equal way to get the small guys. In this new uh, scientific beta CSSA, blah, 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 what you get is out of 52 stocks, 41 drive the return. In other words, I'm getting the small guys in it, and that's what I want with my vanilla local ETF holding. As long as that ratio stays, typically the ratio for indices around the world is at about... 20 to 25 percent of the shares actually drive return and that's true across all markets us s p italy italy and india even less but it's true across markets across the world and i want the wider driver of return as long as we hold that at around 80 percent i'm a comfortable holder of it if that starts to drop to that well then then we've just got a fancy name without return so quickly to end, a few quick points. I'm going to go fast because I'm out of time. Uh, should you do monthly or should you do lump sum? Short answer, if you can, do lump sum. I know there's a risk the market will crash the next day, but the odds are it won't because the market crashes on very few days of your life, and therefore the earlier you're in, the better you get. So if you can afford to do lump sum, do everything on Friday next week. Don't do monthly. If you can't, well, then do monthly because it's what you can, and that's just how life circumstances. Don't leave it for the last minute. I hear this story every year. I know that's what's going to happen in about 10 or 12 days' time. Someone's going to phone me, and they're going to say, I moved money on Tuesday, and it didn't reflect in the tax year, and now it's in the new tax year. And I want to take that provider to the Constitutional Court. I'm like, cool, knock yourself out. You know what? Stuff goes wrong. You know when you move money and it disappears? I moved money last night. It left my account at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It arrived at my next account at 8 o'clock this morning. Where did it go? Could have gone to Cape Town? No, Cape Town's too far. Probably went to Durban. Point is, you know, if you're leaving it until 5 to 5 on the 28th and you hit the send button and it doesn't get there, don't phone me, don't phone the issuer, and don't phone the Concord. Don't leave it for the last minute is the honest answer. And then a quick last slide, this courtesy of Narina Fisser. ETFSA, how to get SARS to pay for your tax free. So if you earn 400,000, and I know 400,000, man, you're drinking a lot of Graham Beck if you're earning 400K. If you earn 400K and you contribute the full 27.5% allowed amount into retirement annuity, you then basically get a kickback from SARS of 33,000 Rand because that money that you deposit into your retirement annuity is deducted from your income. And SARS just funded your tax free. If you're scratching your head, Ms. Fisser is hiding behind that pillar there. Chat to her on your way out. 
So the short answer is, should you have one? Yes, there is no question that you should. Your first 33,000 Rand a year should go here, unless you're asking SARS to fund you, in which case, get SARS to pay your 33,000. But there is no good reason to not have a tax-free account. The government is trying to give you money. If you don't want the government's money, well, then the government wants it. Um, ignore the short-term gyrations of the stock market. Stock markets do crazy stuff. Over the long term, which is in 20 year plus, stock markets go up. I've got tons of data going back to the 60s that show you quantifiably stock markets are a place to be and that over the long term, this is where wealth is created. This is a long-term investment product. Keep it simple. We can make it complicated. I'm not convinced that complexity equals better. I know as human beings, we wired to believe that, but I'm not convinced that complexity, I don't believe that statement. I mean, complexity leads to errors, is my sense. Uh, and watch the costs. Be a penny pincher here. Every penny counts, because that's a penny in your pocket that can grow multiples over the many decades, rather than in somebody's luxury sedan or Verve Clicquot. Your pocket there. Ladies and gents, thank you very, very much for your time this evening.